Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. God is good. All right, let's get our Bibles out. Go with me to the book of Exodus, Exodus, the 17th chapter. Tonight, I want to talk to you about a subject called the life of prayer, the life of prayer. You know, uh, I am not one of those guys who is, is you know, waking up at 5 a.m. and praying for hours or, you know, just going into dreams and visions and stuff when I pray. I'm one of those guys that has to discipline himself. And I have to set aside time in my day and I have to uh, discipline, uh, you know, getting up. Um, I have to discipline myself throughout my day to stay in prayer, stay connected to God because otherwise I will get distracted, uh, I'll get busy, things will happen. But really, when I take a look at the Word of God, I see that God wants not just a, a, a set of prayers or just a time of prayer. God wants us to have a life of prayer. And as we have a life of prayer, there will be a, a life in our prayers that is imparted to us. And that our prayer life will take on a life of His own. And the more I spend time with God, the better life gets. And that's why it's so important that we do pray. In fact, when you start seeing answers to prayer, you can only uh, just pray more because you realize, wow, there's power in my prayers. There's things going on when I pray. Uh, when you start to feel the presence of God in your prayers, you start to press in because, oh my goodness, God, that's what I've been desiring. That's what I've been wanting. And as you grow in your prayer life, your life of prayer will grow more and more. We see a battle that took place in Exodus, the 17th chapter. Children of Israel coming out of Egypt, and here they are, they're traveling, and as they travel, uh, some things take place, and they're on the road, and they finally come to a place of rest. There, in Exodus, the 17th chapter, we pick up the story, verse number 8. Exodus, chapter 17, verse number 8, it says, Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Now, that's quite a statement because Amalek was another nation. And they came against the nation of Israel at a place called Rephidim. Rephidim means rest. So here's Israel. They're on a place of rest. And Amalek comes and fights with Israel. Now notice, Amalek is the aggressor here. Israel was just traveling, just on their way to the promised land. And now here comes a fight. Here comes a battle. Don't you know, sometimes you can be going through life, just doing your thing. Maybe you're just taking a rest. Maybe you're kicking back. Maybe you're enjoying life. And all of a sudden, here comes the battle. Let's see what happens. Next verse, verse number nine. And Moses said to Joshua, choose us some men and go out and fight with Amalek tomorrow. I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. This is the same rod that the Lord said, with this rod I will deliver Israel. Same rod that he stretched out over the seas and they parted. Same rod that he had just struck the rock and water poured out from it. So he says, I, I know something about God. I know that God is our deliverer. I know that God is our strength. And therefore, you go fight the battle. I'm going up on the hill and I'm going to oversee with the rod of God in my hand. Don't you know that we have power? That we have the authority and the government of God in our hands. And that should encourage us that anytime things come up, anytime there's a battle that we face, anytime we look at our kids and we go, wait a second, is that just allergies or is there something more going on there? We have the authority of God to speak in the name of Jesus and to bring God's kingdom here on the earth. Am I talking to anybody tonight? When you take a look at your checkbook and you realize, oh my goodness, I don't know how I'm going to make it. Listen, you go to work and I will stand with the rod of God in my hand, the authority of God, that God is going to take care of my needs. When you look at life and you're saying, life just isn't working out, it's a dredge, and I don't know what's going on, and I just feel apathetic, I feel spiritually sick, I don't feel close to God, I don't even feel like praying. Listen, get a hold of that rod and go up to the mountain, and you win that battle up on the mountain. Come on, somebody. Verse 10, so Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Verse 11, so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. I could almost see it, you know, kind of like a, a football game. You, you remember those old uh, goofy cartoons where they had the two teams, and they were battling on the field, you know, and you see the ball kind of just flipping around, stuff like that. I kind of picture Joshua and the children of Israel in blue and Amalek in red, and here they are just, you know, when Moses' hands are up, you know, here comes Joshua and the children of Israel, but then when his hands go down, here comes Amalek and the red team's winning, and they're just kind of battling back and forth, and you can just kind of see, you know, he's holding up his hands, but anybody that's held up their hands for any period of time knows that Amalek after a while, it starts to 
starts to sag, starts to come down, starts to hurt, starts to be pain. You know, I worked construction for a number of years, and, you know, anytime we were painting up here, you know, or anytime you're having to screw stuff in or anything up top, man, after a while, you just kind of had to sink and kind of rest because this, this is hard work. See, sometimes we, we let down in the spirit because we don't have the strength. Like the disciples in the garden where Jesus said, yeah, you know what, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And we have to go after it in our prayers. We have to make sure that we watch and pray lest we fall into temptation and the enemy win the battle. So we've got to stay fervent in our prayer time. Look at what it says in verse number 12. But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him and he sat on it. And Aaron and her supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. See, we, sometimes you need people to come alongside you in prayer. Sometimes you need an Aaron and you need a her to lift up your hands, somebody to steady you. And, and, and you need them to support you. You need them to bring you back to the rock. That rock is Jesus Christ. And you need to be seated, firmly grounded, founded on the rock. See, when you are seated with Christ in heavenly places and you pray from that place of authority and you got people lifting you up, then your hands will be steady to the going down of the sun. Throughout life, you will be able to stand you'll be able to have those victories goes on and it says in verse number 13 so joshua defeated amalek and his people with the edge of the sword verse 14 then the lord said to moses write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of joshua that i will utterly blot out the remembrance of amalek from under heaven verse 15 and moses built an altar and called its name the lord is my banner or jehovah nisi that banner was that standard that they would lift up they would show, some of you guys have seen the Civil War movies like Glory, where they wanted to make sure that their flag was still standing, wanted to make sure that the standard was raised, wanted to make sure that they knew, maybe you've seen the old war movies where, you know, they came according to their standard and they had these tall poles and up on top they had the different colors and the different insignias. In and of themselves, all they were was just a piece of material and some wood that held something up. But what they symbolized, what they showed forth was a, a call to battle, was a call to arms. And literally with their standard, if you saw an army coming with a certain standard, you would know the name of the king, you would know the army, you would know how many battles they had fought, you would know the victories that they had won, and you would be considering whether or not you really wanted to go to war against that army because of look at that standard. I, I don't know if I want to go up against them. See, in the same way Moses says, here we are, we fought a battle, and Joshua won. Why? Because Moses had the rod of God up on the mountain because he was in the face of God in prayer. And now he says, it's not any other standard. This is not because I was so cool or because the staff was so cool or because Joshua was so cool, but the Lord himself is my banner. I'm going to lift him high. I'm going to lift up his name. I'm going to exalt him, and he's the one that gives us the victory. Today I want to show you what a life of prayer looks like, but also where we find the life in our prayers. See, there's something that takes place when we get into the face of God and we start to pray. We start to add our passion. We start to add our fervency. The Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much or is very effective. And so in our lives, when we pray, we need to add heart, we need to add passion, and we need to add life because then our prayers will start to add life to us. Are you listening tonight? Life of prayer, number one, is in its consistency. In its consistency. I want you to turn in your Bibles to the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians 5. We were there this morning in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, great section of Scripture. But the life of prayer is in its consistency. You remember Moses was on the rock that rock showed stability, it showed steadfastness, it was steady, it was solid. That rock was immovable, it wasn't going anywhere. And what did it say? It said that his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. See, our prayer life needs to be a life that shows itself in its consistency. We need to pray. Jesus told parables about praying and not giving up, praying and not losing heart. Praying and going after it. You remember the, the widow and the unjust judge, she kept coming day after day after day after day like a dripping faucet. She just kept nagging him. She kept after him. She cried out, when will you give me justice? And finally the unjust judge says, man, my goodness, I'm, I'm going to give this woman what she wants unless she weary me by her coming. 
And Jesus turns around to his disciples and said, hear the parable, hear what the unjust judge says. Now this is someone who is unjust. Realize that your God is just and how much more will he deliver those and provide for those who are his own children? See, God wants to answer your prayers, but you've got to pray and you've got to pray consistently and you've got to not give up. Are you listening tonight? Had you turned there with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, look at verse number 17, three words that should impact each and every one of our lives, three words that we should memorize, three words that we should print backwards on our forehead so that when we look in the mirror, we can remember them. What does it say? It says, pray without ceasing. Quite plain and simple. Can you remember those three words? Pray without ceasing. You say, Pastor, what does that mean? Does that mean that I need to continually pray? Does that mean that I can't go to bed at night? Does that mean that I can't go to work? That I can't talk to my family? No. Obviously, God knows the life that we're living. God knows where we're at. God knows what we're doing. God knows the place that he's put us in. Well, what God is saying is don't give up. Be consistent in your prayers throughout your day. Pray. Take time to pray. But then in the midst of your day, pray. And pray without ceasing. Don't give up on God. Don't give up on your prayers. Don't ever cut off the lines of communication. Sometimes people think because I said amen, I hung up the phone on God. That's not how it works, though. Amen simply means so be it here on the earth. Remember one, uh, one guy in the church said that he would not say amen at the end of his prayer so that he would remember that he kept the line of communication open. Now, see, I believe that we can keep that same heart, that same attitude, just leaving the phone off the hook, right? It's almost like you ever been butt-dialed? You guys know what a butt dial is? That's where somebody puts their phone in their pocket and is still on and as they're walking, it dials you, right? And then all you hear, you, you know, you pick up the phone, you say, hello, hello, right? And you start yelling, hello, and then you realize who it is because you hear them talking to somebody else, you know, and you hear kind of like the, uh, the Charlie Brown parents, wah, 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 wah. oh, that's, that's Joe. Joe, Joe, can you hear me? Joe, hello. And Joe's just talking, just having a good time, laughing about a joke, and then you hear zip, 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 zip. See, we need to make sure that we continue to keep the phone on with God all day. Keep the lines of communication open. I love scriptures like where Jesus is going about his day, all of a sudden he's talking to God about something. How about Nehemiah? Here he is. He's about ready to go before the king. He gets called in, and what's he do? He throws up a quick prayer. Lord, give me favor as I go in. See, how much greater would our lives be if when we were about ready to go in to that meeting with the boss and all the big wigs, if we said, God, give me favor. God, give me the wisdom. Lord, give me the words to say. We go into the break room, and God, give me, give me a witness right now, Lord. Open up a door of utterance that I can speak to my coworkers about Jesus. When we go home, God, just bless our family time. Bless our life together. You know, you're about ready to sit at the table. Don't just pray over the food, because that's the thing that Christians are supposed to do. Give thanks. God, thank you for this food. Thank you for the money that provided it. Thank you for the hands that prepared it. Thank you, Lord, that it will bless my body for health, strength, and nourishment. May we use that energy to serve you all the days of our life. See, prayer is that communication communication line with God and you need to never hang up the phone even when you go to bed God speak to me as I sleep God give me dreams godly dreams Lord speak to me in the night season God just show me God declare to me see prayer is a two way conversation not just us talking at God all the time but us talking with God where we hear the voice of the Lord and did you know that your spirit can still hear while you're asleep God can speak to you in the night God could visit you God could give you a vision my goodness what can't God do but we need to make sure that we're consistent. John Bunyan said, you can do more than pray after you have prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. See, we can go out and do all the work and do everything. We can do anything else after we pray, but we can't do anything until we've prayed. Oswald Chambers said, get into the habit of dealing with God about everything. Unless in the first waking moment of the day you learn to fling the door wide back and let God in, you will work on a wrong level all day. But swing the door wide open and pray to your Father in secret, and every public thing will be stamped with the presence of God. Isn't that great? That's the kind of life I want to live where my life is just stamped with the presence of God. Come on, can you give the Lord a praise today? First thing, the life of prayer is in its consistency. Second thing, the life of prayer is in its diversity. Do you know there's different kinds of prayers? See, Moses, he prayed both standing with his arms up and sitting with his arms held up. 
And there's different postures of prayer. Now, I'm not only talking about the physical, because you can pray sitting, you can pray kneeling, you can pray standing, you can pray prostrate on the ground, you can pray in the car, you can pray in the shower, you can pray at work, you can pray at home, you can pray in any posture. But above and beyond that, spiritually, there are different types of prayers that we can pray. Let me show this to you in the Bible. If you want, uh, turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Once again, we were in Ephesians chapter 6 this morning. Great verses, but in Ephesians chapter number 6, I want to show you something. See, our position in prayer is in Christ. Therefore, our posture in prayer physically doesn't matter as much as the practice of prayer. Ephesians chapter 6, take a look at verse number 18. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 says, Praying always, there's that consistency. There's that praying without ceasing. Praying always with all prayer. Now notice it doesn't say some prayer or one prayer or the prayer, but it says all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Now look up on the overhead. I've highlighted some words. Praying always with all prayer. Supplication in the spirit. Supplication is what we ask God for what we're petitioning God for, what we're bringing before the Lord. It's our request and it's as well our concerns and our cares that we're bringing up before God. And he says in the spirit, did you know that you can pray in your understanding as well as pray in your spirit? God's given us a prayer language. Those of us that have been baptized with the Holy Spirit, the Bible says they, they shall speak with new tongues. And the apostle Paul says if I pray in the spirit, then you know, my spirit is edified. I, I build up my spirit man. You can pray in the spirit. And he says, being watchful. Did you know that you can watch after things in prayer? You can look after things in prayer? That God, I, you know what? This is just concerning me, God. I don't know what it is about this. But God, I'm bringing it up before you right now. God, just show me what it is you want me to do with that. Sometimes you'll know things by the Spirit. My wife is, is notorious for saying, I just, oh, Dan, I don't know about that person. And I said, well, what about him? I don't know. And I said, well, let's pray. You know, let's just commit it to the Lord. And we'll pray about it. And oftentimes, something will be revealed later on. And that's why we were praying. See, see, that's why we were praying, honey. That's what's going on. We see now why that was happening. See, you can be watchful. To this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, pray for yourself, pray for your family, pray for your life, pray for your relationship with God, pray for world events, pray for others, pray for the church, pray for the saints, pray for blessings, pray for your finances, pray for your job, pray for wisdom, pray, 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 pray. Like the... Uh, Modern day prophet MC Hammer said, we need to pray just to make it today. <laughs> you ever heard of the axe method? Some, some people like the cat's method or the axe method. Did anybody learn that other than me growing up? Okay, must have been just, a, okay, a couple of you guys maybe? Or are you scratching your head? Okay, nobody's ever heard of that. All right, praise God. So, oh, thanks, Bob. Appreciate the, the uh, attaboy there. Yeah, axe and cats. Confession, adoration, thanksgiving, supplication, little way to remember. If you, if you need help starting your prayers, you might start with confession. God, I confess my sin before you. Then adoration, Lord, you're awesome. God, you're wonderful. Thanksgiving, thank you, God, for everything, God. Thank you for life. Thank you for breath. Thank you for air. Thank you for beauty. Thank you for grace. Thank you for goodness. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. And then supplication, God, I'm just bringing this up before you. Now, some people like the Acts method, they do adoration first, then confession, then thanksgiving, then supplication. But don't limit it to that. Uh, look at our Lord's Prayer, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. See, there's that adoration. God, you're awesome. God, you're holy. God, you're wonderful. God, you're everything. And just worship the Lord. And then he says, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Pray that prayer of submission. God, not my will, but yours be done. God, not my kingdom be built. God, your kingdom be built. Not my authority or my government. God, your will, your way. Give us this day our daily bread. See, there's the supplication. God, what we need for life, God, give it to us. Give it to us through your word. Give it to us through the knowledge of God. Open the eyes of my understanding, Lord. Let me hear what it is that you're speaking to me today, God, and forgive us of our sins. See, there's that confession. God, forgive me, as we also forgive those who have sinned against us. Now you're coming in line with the will and the way of God and releasing the forgiveness that God in Christ forgave you with. 
For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. See, Jesus modeled in his prayer the different types of prayer, and you can see it all throughout the Bible, all kinds of prayers. The apostle Paul had prayers for the church, prayers for the saints, prayers for uh, spiritual understanding, prayers for prosperity, prayers for wisdom. You can pray through the Proverbs. You can pray through the Psalms. You can pray throughout the Bible. Find yourself a scripture, a promise, and pray. It's good. We need to pray. We need to lift each other up. We need to lift up the saints. Uh, I like a little story that I, I, I read today. It came from a sermon uh, titled The Story of the Iron Gate by Clarence J. Forrestberg. Okay, hopefully I said that right. And he says this. Many years ago, Bishop McConnell told a story of something that happened in a little fishing village on the New England coast. One winter's day, a storm came up, and suddenly while boats were out at sea, the men rode desperately to reach the safety of the harbor. Everybody made it except for one old man named John. He had almost reached the mouth of the harbor when a great wave came along and dashed his tiny boat up against a rock. He managed to pull himself up on a tiny ledge and hang there for dear life. His friends saw what happened. There wasn't anything they could do about it. It was growing dark and the seas were high. All they could do was wait. They built a bonfire on the shore and kept it burning all night. Every once in a while, someone would throw his cap up in the air, hoping that the old man would see it. At last, dawn began to break and the winds began to die down. They put out their boats and were able to get close enough so they could bring him safely back to the shore. When the old man had been warmed by the fire and had been given something to eat, they asked, what was it like out there? Well, he said, it was the longest night of my life. I made it out pretty well at first, but then a big wave came along and flattened me out and I felt myself slipping. I was worn out. I was ready to give up. My old father went down at sea and I had decided my time has come. But just as I was ready to let go, I looked through the darkness and saw somebody's cap going up in the air. I said to myself, if somebody who cares enough about old John to stay out on a night like this, I guess I'm not going to quit yet. Just then, the wind seemed to ease up, and I got a fresh hold, and well, here I am. See, maybe in this place tonight, you didn't know someone's praying for you. Maybe in this place tonight, you came in and you're discouraged. But I'm here to tell you, church, You have people here in this church that love you and that are praying for you. We have teams that pray all day just for you. If you ever send in a prayer need to the church, we've got uh, uh, the, the prayer cards out there that tonight, if you have a prayer request, just write down your prayer on that card and drop it there in, the, in the, the wooden box there and teams of people, hundreds of people from the rock will be praying for you. Your pastors will be praying for you, be lifting you up. If you ever call the front offices, dial zero and say, I have a prayer request. Can you just get people praying for me? We will be praying for you. Email us, email at rockchurch.com and you can just type your prayer request and we will make sure that that gets on the prayer list and we'll be lifting you up. See, what happens is you may be dashed against a rock, the waves may have risen high and you don't know how you're gonna wake it and you feel your fingers slipping off but listen, there is a church that's throwing their cap up in the air and we're lifting you up, believing God, sending up all kinds of prayers on your behalf. Make sure that we pray with consistency but also that we pray in diversity. Next thing for tonight is the life of prayer is in its ability. Not only its consistency and its diversity, but also the life of prayer is in its ability. Turn with me to John the 15th chapter. John the 15th chapter. The life of prayer is in its ability. See, what we pray about in private will be seen in public. We talked about that. There will be that stamp, that mark of God on our lives, knowing that we spent time with Jesus Mary, the queen of Scotland, said, I fear John Knox's prayers more than any army of 10,000 men. John Knox was an evangelist and a pastor, and he did great and wonderful things in Scotland. And for the queen to say, I fear his prayers more than the armies of my enemies, that's quite a statement. But that shows the power of prayer. Again, Sidlow Baxter said, men may spurn our appeals, reject our message, oppose our arguments, despise our persons, but they are helpless against our prayers. Now listen, let me ask you something. Can you go into the White House and get a hold of the president right now? Can you call him up? Can you go walk into his private chamber? Can you get into the Oval Office tomorrow? No. Well, unless you're that guy that ran up and just opened the door and walked in. (laughs) But no, we can't. We cannot get in to see the president because they probably put a lock on the door by now, hopefully. But see, in the natural It's not going to happen. We're here in California. That's all the way over there on the East Coast. And we cannot get an audience with the president. You can't walk in and just say, Mr. President, I need you to do something. I need you to change your mind. I need you to put this law through. I need you to uh, repeal this. See, we can't do that. 
We can't get in. Uh, we can't even get in to see the governor of our state. I I'd say you'd have a hard time probably getting to see the mayor of San Bernardino or of one of the surrounding communities. You probably have to set up an appointment. It's probably very busy, things going on. You might have to wait a while in order to get in. But I'm here to tell you that you've been given access and entrance to Almighty God into his private chamber. And now you can approach the throne of grace and find help, to help in a time of need. And therefore, your prayers can literally go into the mayor's office. They can literally go into the governor's office. They can go all the way to the East Coast, into the Oval Office, and they can cause change because the Bible says the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and he can turn it like a water course wherever he desires. See, your prayers have more power than you realize. Like the church that was praying for Peter. Here's Peter locked up. Herod's going to kill him. All of a sudden, in the middle of the night, the doors swing open. He stands up. The chains fall off. He's led by an angel out of the place. The door comes open on its own accord, and he walks out. And it's not until he gets out in the street that he realizes, this is real. I'm not dreaming. And he goes to the house where the saints are praying. He knocks on the door, and a lady comes up and answers the door. And she realizes, it's Peter. And she gets so excited, she leaves him there at the door. She runs back and she tells everybody praying, hey, Peter's outside, guys, it worked, we prayed. And he's released. And they said, no, it's his ghost, he's probably dead. And how many of us are like that? I know, can I, can I be honest with you guys? There's times where I prayed and I felt like, oh, if anything happens, it's probably just a ghost. It's probably just a phantom. Probably just, yeah. But finally, the girl said, okay, listen, you guys, come on, he's at the door, let me go show you. She goes back to the door, opens it up, and there's Peter, and they all rejoice. Well, listen, our prayers have more power than we know. Sometimes our prayers that we don't even believe as much as we should have more power than we know, because all it takes is faith as a mustard seed. All it takes is obedience to God's will. All it takes is God's word. I had an instructor at my Bible class that I went to who was talking about doing a hospital visit. And the situation looked grim. There was a guy who was hooked up to every kind of device you could think of, had tubes going in everywhere. And, and he just walked in and he thought, this guy's dead. And he went in to pray and he looked at the family and said, okay, let's pray. And he laid his hands on that guy and he said, in the name of Jesus. And the guy went, <gasps> and stood up in the bed right then and there. Now see, after a prayer like that, it's almost like, you know, our prayers have more power than we even know. And so we need to pray. Why? Because our prayers have ability. You have the power of God on your side, and all you got to do to tap into it is just ask the Father. All you got to do is tap into the presence of God. You there in John chapter 15? John chapter 15, look at verse number seven, great verse. Jesus is speaking. If you have a red letter edition Bible, this is the words of Christ in red. And look at what he says. If you abide in me, if you live, stay, and dwell where? In me. And my words abide in you. There is the rod of God in your hand. If you have the word of God, you have the authority and the government and the kingdom of God at your disposal. If you abide in me, you're in Christ. And my words abide in you. Look at what he says. You will ask what you desire. Now notice your desires are coming from the inward part of you. So if the word of God is in you and you're asking according to your desire, most likely what you're asking about lines up with the will and the word of God. That's good because that's a prayer God can answer every time. You never have to wonder. First John chapter 5, verse number 14 and 15. If we ask according to his will, he hears us. If we know that he hears us, we know that we have what we've asked of him. So if you abide in me, my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire. And look at what the last part of it says. And it shall be done for you. See, we complicate prayer too much sometimes. Am I in Christ? Yes. Do I have the word of God? Yes. Then ask, and it's gonna happen. It's just that simple when it comes to prayer. Don't complicate it. You don't have to spit and yell. Don't have to make long prayers. Jesus said, I don't want idle babblings. I don't want, you know, oh, dear Father God, hallowed. You know, you don't have to go into the old King James speak in order for God to hear you. He speaks plain English. Prayer is just talking to God, just like a child asking their father for something. God is your father in heaven. And he wants to give good gifts to his children. But you got to ask. Life of prayer is in its ability. Last one for tonight. The life of prayer is given in a name. The life of prayer is given in a name. Remember Moses, after the victory, called the name of the altar that he built. The Lord is my banner. 
Jehovah Nisi. There was a name that was given. Our prayers are offered up to God and they are signed, sealed, and delivered with the name that we lift up. His banner, that name, is the name of Jesus. And as we lift him high and as we pray in his name, then we have the things that we've asked of him. Jesus, we pray in the name of Jesus. Jesus said, you will ask me nothing on that day, but you will go to the Father and ask in my name. And I will give it to you that the Father may be glorified in the Son. In fact, turn me to you there in John 15. Turn back to John chapter number 14. John chapter number 14. And in John 14 verse 13 and 14, it says this. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. Look at verse 14. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now listen, God is not a slot machine. You put in your prayer, you put in your coin, and you pull the lever, and then the candy comes out. That's not God, okay? But what is God saying? If you ask anything in my name, if you hold up the rod of God, if you have the authority of God's word and a desire for the word and the will and the way of God, then you can ask anything. Anything you can find in here, you can ask for. You know, you can ask for a godly marriage. You can ask for blessing. You can ask for prosperity. You can ask for financial wealth and resource. You can ask for good works. You can ask for words. You can ask for the spirit. You can ask for grace. You can ask for favor. You can ask for wisdom. You can ask for relationship help. You can ask for healing. You can ask for all kinds of things. If you can find it in the word, you can ask for it. And Jesus says, whatever you ask, I'll do it. But ask in my name. Ask in the authority and in the power of the name of Jesus. That's how we pray. Remember I was praying with my kids one night and we were all praying around, you know, and everybody's doing their nightly prayers and I prayed and I said, amen. My son stopped me and said, daddy, no. I said, what do you mean no? He says, you didn't say in Jesus' name, amen. And I said, oh, well, why do we do that, son? And he looked at me and, and I kid you not, out of the mouth of babes, he says, Jesus' name is the key that unlocks the answers to our prayers. I said, man, our children ministry has been teaching you something, boy. Hello. But how awesome is that? Jesus' name is the key that unlocks the answers to our prayers. And when we go to the Father and we ask in Jesus' name, now we have the authority of the word of God on our behalf that we can ask, and we know that if we can find it in the word, whatever it is, that we will have those things that we asked of him. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 45, I'll just put it up on the overheads for you. Very interesting when a young David probably a teenager, was going up against the giant Goliath. Remember what he said? You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you, how? In the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Listen, if the devil comes knocking, circumstances, situations come and try you, they come, the pressures of life come, lack, need, suffering, whatever it is, sickness, despair, depression, you come up and you say, you may come to me with depression. You may come to me with sickness. You may come to me with poverty, poverty and lack and need, want. You may come to me with temptation and trial. Oh, but listen, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Jesus is his name. He is the almighty God, the everlasting. And the Lord is my banner. And in Jesus' name, I receive the promises of God. Can you say amen tonight? So be it here on the earth. Hallelujah. But I want to make sure that you're praying in the right way. You say, well, pastor, we talked about this, didn't we? No. Uh, we, we kind of touched on the subject, but really, it's not just a formula. It's not just in Jesus' name, amen. It's not just the types of prayer. There was a position that we talked about for a moment called being in Christ. See, the Bible says, if I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have heard my prayers. And there has to come a time for each and every one of us that we look at our lives and we say, what's important? Where am I going to end up when all of this is said and done? Is what I'm doing here and now more important than what's going to happen to me in eternity? And I want to present you that opportunity tonight just to examine your heart and find out where you're at with God by asking you a question. I want you to answer this question in your heart. No one will know the answer, but you and God. Just quietly in your heart, I want you to answer this question. What if tonight was your last night on the earth? You died. Where would you end up? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Now, God forbid that should happen to any of us in this room tonight. But what if? 
hypothetically. Tonight was your last night. Where would you go? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Sometimes people say, Pastor, I don't believe in hell. Isn't that convenient? You know, the Bible talks about hell, Old and New Testament. And do you think that by burying your head in the sand, you're going to escape the reality of what God says? No, you're going to have to face it. It wasn't made for you and me. It was made for the devil and his angels that rebelled. And we can choose with our life where we go, whether we go to heaven or whether we go to hell. Tonight, I want to make sure you don't end up there. Listen, you want to make sure you don't end up there. But most of all, God loves you so much that he sent Jesus beaten, bloody, and hung on a cross so that you didn't have to go there. And now he offers to you a way to heaven. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, all roads lead to heaven, don't they? I mean, that's why Jesus went to the cross was to open up heaven. Now, hey, the gates are swung wide and everybody can enter in. You just do your thing, I'll do my thing. The church is out there, whatever they like, you know, if they like religion or if they like, you know, loosey-goosey, whatever. You know, just as long as they stay true to themselves and know about God and that sort of thing, that you get to heaven, you know, all roads lead to heaven. But the problem with that thing is, you know that the Bible never says all roads lead to heaven. That's like me saying all roads lead to the moon. Just drive around the earth and you'll get there somehow. Listen, you're not going to make it. Only one way you're going to get to the moon. In the same way, only one way you're going to get to go to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. That means it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Jesus was speaking to a man who was a religious leader of his day by the name of Nicodemus. He was a good guy. Did a lot of good deeds. He was, uh, you know, a leader in his church. He could quote the scripture. He could debate the scripture. He could sing the scripture. How many of us could do that? And when Jesus was speaking to him about this topic of how to get to heaven, he says, Nicodemus, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. It's that simple. You want to enter the kingdom of heaven? You must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They've raked it through the coals, made it out to be something that it's not. Made it out to be some weirdo, goofy thing. But listen, this is not about what Hollywood, movies, television, books, the internet, or our society says about being born again. What does being born again really mean from the Bible? Here's what it means. It means you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's just that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. Last book of the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot. Or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are gross graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what's he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and again, occasional church attendance, some good works, thinking that you're all right, but then doing some of your own thing. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. Hot or cold, but if you're lukewarm, Jesus says, I will vomit you from my mouth. So tonight, let me love you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it to heaven just by your good works. Not going to make it to heaven just by sitting in church and calling yourself a Christian. Listen, that's like me saying I can go to my garage, call myself a car, and that makes me a car. It doesn't work. Not going to get to heaven by... You know, being raised in church, your parents telling you you're Christian, or being born in America, or because you're not some other religion. Listen, none of that works. Not going to get to heaven by volunteering at a church, or singing in the choir, or carrying the pastor's Bible, getting a membership card. Not going to get into heaven just because you know who God is, because the Bible says demons know who God is. They're not Christians. The devil himself can quote scriptures and knows who Jesus is. And yet, that's not going to get you into heaven. You must be born again. Have you given God all of your heart? Have you given God all of your life? Tonight, if not, then I love you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. But let's not leave you there. I want to give you an opportunity tonight. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. Bang! Pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Hold on. We'll do it all together. Hands are already going up. Now, you might be saying, well, pastor, wait a second. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Listen, I'm not going to embarrass you. But think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever? No one make that trade. So tonight, who should raise their hand? If you've been running from God instead of you, God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Tonight, come on, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never given, given God all of your heart, given God all of your life? Come on, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm and you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it? 
Get ready to get your hand up all across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television, in the foyer, in the Love Rock Cafe, or online all over the world and across the nation. Get ready to get your hand up. God is watching. God sees. And then you can either click Respond to God or on our homepage, there's a button, How to Know God, and someone will lead you in a prayer right there. Count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one. There's two. God bless you. Who else tonight? Who else tonight? I got you, guy. You can put your hand down. Who else tonight that I didn't already see? There's two wise people already. You're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Yeah, you should. Come on, let's go for God tonight. Anybody else real quick? I'm going to give you an opportunity just to check your heart out. Where are you out with God? Where would you end up tonight? If you say, I don't know, come on, let's go for God. Is there anybody else? Thank you in the family room. Is that a hand? All right, got you. Thank you. Who else? There's three wise people already. Anybody else? Is that a hand right there? Just give me a little wave if it is. All right, cool. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Got you. Thank you. All right, there's about four or five wise people. Who else? Thank you. Got you over there. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? If you feel like, you know, your heart's about ready to beat out of your chest, probably God's tugging at the strings of your heart saying, come on, let's go. Let's do this. Anybody else real quick? Just want to give you an opportunity. When I'm looking in your direction, just pop it up high for me. If that's you, is there anybody else? Anybody else in this section over here? Anybody else on this side? Anybody else over here back in the family rooms? Anybody else? All right, well, let's give the Lord a hand. There's about five or six wise people tonight. Hallelujah. God is good. All right, all five, six of you, and if you're number seven, eight, nine, and ten, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. The moment we're all going to stand, we're going to give the clap and a shout. That's your cue. Get your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church. Get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight. But we can't do that till we get you down here. So if that's you, you raise your hand or you should raise your hand. Let's all stand and welcome them. You come right now. Just get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. You come right now. Come on down. Come on down. Won't you come They're coming. Come on, let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Come on. Won't you come just as you are. Anybody else, if you need to come, just make your way to the front right now. From the family rooms. Come on, you can bring your children. They'll remember this. From the foyer, if you raise your hand out there, come on into the church service right now. Anybody else? All right. Praise God, you guys. Hey, so thankful that you guys have come. Came to give God all your heart. Came to give God all of your life. All right, right over here to my right, your left. This is my friend, Pastor Joel. He's a really good guy. Nothing weird is going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? I'm about as weird as you're going to encounter tonight, okay? He's cool. He's going to do three things. He's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. Secondly, he's going to give you some free information, some free literature that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. And then thirdly, he's going to introduce you to a program that we have here called Spiritual Personal Trainers, and then he'll let you come right back out. Your friends and family will wait for you. Now listen, I want to make a promise to you guys, okay? Give us a year, one year of your life here at the Rock Church World Outreach Center, sitting under the teaching consistently. You know, we talked about consistency in prayer. Well, you also need to hear the word of the Lord. You need to get into church and get consistent in your walk with God. We want to help you to do that. After that year and for the rest of your life, here's the promise. A promise that you're going to look around and say, oh my goodness, I didn't realize it could be this good. Am I telling the truth, everybody? Okay, take their word for it, all right? It all starts with the Spiritual Personal Trainers Program. He'll describe how it works. It's easy, it's free, and you need to do it, okay? And then he'll let you come right back out. So if you guys would make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way. Come on, let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now 
a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.